Well, good morning, Chapel family. Good morning, friends. Thank you for joining us this day to, to celebrate once again the presence of God, the reality of God, the truth of God, the love of God, the goodness of God in our lives. And whether you're sitting there in your jammies or starting some of your daily chores, I hope you take these next few minutes to set us that aside and turn the affections of your heart to Jesus. To just say, Lord, I want to take this time just to love you because you love me. So I want to begin with Psalm 103. It's one of my all-time favorites. And it's a psalm of David. <clears throat> and it's a well-known psalm where David says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And its place remembers it no more. But... But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those who remember his commandments to do them. The Lord, the Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels. And I know it's an empty auditorium this morning, but bless the Lord, you his angels. We read in the book of Revelation that is the redeemed of God, along with myriads and myriads of angels who are blessing the name of the Lord. Let's invite the angelic host to worship with us this morning. Said, Bless the Lord, you his angels who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you ministers of his who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. I just want to encourage you to just bless the Lord today. And I know we're going through a season that's impacting not only our community, but our nation and the nations of this world. But let us, as the redeemed of God, uh, lift up a song of praise and rejoicing and victory to him. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and everything that's within me, bless his holy name. We rejoice that his presence is with us at this hour as we celebrate him together. God bless you as you join us in the worship team, uh, magnifying his name today. Amen.
Father, you are with us, and every moment that we spend with you um, is not wasted, God. I thank you so much for this precious time that we get to spend with you, and we get to spend um, with your people, um, even in, in heart if we're not all together. Father, I just 
pray a special blessing over each and every person um, that's worshiping right now, God. We thank you so much for your heart of love for us, God. Continue to draw us closer to you, draw us deeper, um, show us even more what your Father's heart toward us is and even what your lover's heart is toward us because, um, God, you are our everything and everything that we have comes from you. Um, so, God, we just want to give you our everything and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, that was an awesome time just to worship God. I want to give a thanks to, to Shayla and her team for leading us in worship this morning. And uh, if you have their number, their text, it'd be awesome if you just uh, sent them a text of encouragement to all the worship teams that have been coming each and every week to give us that sense of family, being together and worshiping God. So <clears throat> let them know that. I also want to thank you, Chapel family, for those who have been sacrificially and generously still giving to the ministry here at Chapel. I know everyone's in uncertain times, and so I've been blessed by your faithfulness. Uh, we do not take this for granted, but it is an expression of your love and your worship and also your uh, faithfulness to the church here. So uh, thank you there, too. And then I just want to uh, <clears throat> jump into the Word of God here tonight. I want to talk about Elijah. I want to talk about Elijah, his victory, <clears throat> very briefly, and then his vulnerability. Uh, I was going to do it the opposite, but I really sense that I need to speak about Elijah and his soul. You know, Elijah knew the thrill of victory, and he also understood the agony of defeat, or I should say apparent defeat. But let's look at the scripture tonight about Elijah, his victory, and his vulnerability. It begins, <clears throat> and it's going to be a story actually of two mountains, one Carmel and the other Horeb. And these two mountains, and I just kind of ballparked the number here right before I came up to speak, are about 350 miles apart geographically speaking. But I want to begin with the showdown, if we have that slide up there, the showdown on Carmel. I want to begin with Elijah's, when his spirit, his soul was so triumphant. It was a showdown. We talk about the showdown at the OK Corral. Uh, this was very similar as the showdown on Mount Carmel. Now, uh, about two years ago, in fact, this time two years ago exactly, I was with several friends here from Chapel, and we traveled to, to Israel. And on the back deck of the house of prayer that several of us were sleeping at, uh, we could walk out onto the back deck and we could see the, the ridge, the Carmel Mountain Ridge. And if you had an eagle's eye, you could look to the very tip of Mount Carmel and you could see from a distance the spot they believed that Elijah confronted uh, Ahab and this great event that we're going to speak about in a minute transpired. In fact, a part of the group traveled one day to the exact location where Elijah and Ahab and these prophets of Baal had their great confrontation. Uh, we read about that in 1 Kings chapter 18. Can't read the entire chapter. I just would recommend that you take some time to read. But I do want to begin right at the beginning in verse 17. It said, Then it happened when Ahab, and I wrote up there, Ahab was the seventh king of the northern kingdom of Israel, and one of the most wicked kings that Israel ever had the joy to experience. And it says, when Ahab sees Elijah, the prophet, that Ahab said to him, is that you, Elijah, O troubler of Israel? And Elijah answered, King, you got it backwards. It's not I who troubles Israel, but you and your father's house, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. 
Now, therefore, and Elijah issues the challenge. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Now, we know that Jezebel was the wife of Ahab. Ahab, if you read his story, was steeped in idolatry. Uh, he had the people of Israel following these false gods. And to, to top it all off, he married Jezebel, this wicked princess from another country. And uh, that's a sermon in and of itself. Uh, but he challenges them to meet at Carmel for this big showdown. So Ahab sent for all children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him, Not a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone have left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. And now I just want to tell the story that's well known to many, if not read it in the text. Here was the challenge. Here was the showdown. Which of the prophets could call down fire from heaven? So the 450 prophets, they get to, they get to go to bat first. And it's an interesting thing as, as, as the day wears on and their sacrifice had been prepared, that they, they are yupping it up and they're crying out to their gods to answer by fire. And it was dead silence. There is not a word from heaven. And they begin to cut themselves and dance and go through all the motions, all this religious stuff to get the gods to respond. Dead silence. Elijah begins to mock them and taunt them and says, what, where is your God? And perhaps he's, and at the literal translation, he's probably stepped aside to use the bathroom. And so then it comes to Elijah's turn. We know the story. He repairs the altar of the Lord. And that's an interesting thing. Sometimes before God answers with fire, the people of God, the prophetic voice of God needs to do some repair work. But he, he repairs the altar. He has a trench dug around it. He, they go down to the brook called Kishon. They bring back, I think, three or four times. And they just pour it over the sacrifice. And so everything is drenching wet. And at that point, we read in the scripture as Elijah prays, God answers. And it says, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, the sacrifice. And it says, now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Uh, this was his triumphant moment. This was revival when all the people who had gathered uh, called upon the name of the one and true God. Uh, and I, I would love to stay there. And I, and I think we are coming, I'll say this much, into a time where the church of the living God needs to find its prophetic voice to speak to the generation around us, to the society, the culture that surrounds us, and so that the people recognize that the Lord, he is God. And I wanted to kind of ride that today, but, but the more as this week wore on and, and news came to my ear of, of some real uh, life struggles, some real despairing situations that, that part of the family is facing, I, th I thought I'd focus more on the second chapter of, of this great story. The one, the celebration of victory, but also, and I think we can glean as much as that from Elijah, the vulnerability of this man's soul. Then after the victory, after the fire fell, we read that 450 prophets were executed on the spot. Uh, and Ahab, King Ahab, goes back to his wife Jezebel, reports everything to her, and, and she has a, <clears throat> a fit of anger, hate, rage. It all arose up in her spirit, and she says, and I'll just jump to that, <clears throat> Oh, this was, uh, to, to conclude this, 
this is a victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So I want to leave that thought with you, but jump right to the second part, the slowdown on Horeb. I started with the showdown on Carmel. I want to now go into the slowdown on Horeb. We read in chapter 19, you can continue to read Jezebel's threat. And there we start to see right away Elijah's vulnerability. And this may be a mystery. That in one moment he has the boldness of a lion. And in the very next, the meekness of a lamb. And it says that he ran for his life. The very same prophet who stood in front of King Ahab, who took on 450 prophets, now is running for his life because of a threat of a woman. He even prays in that text that he might die, but in an ironic way, he doesn't want to be killed by Jezebel. So he kind of clicks into crisis mode at dealing with a brand new situation that has come into his life. And I really think that kind of speaks to the day, the season, the month uh, that we are going through right now. You know, we can be riding high in our soul one day, triumphant, and just in a matter of a few short days, a few short weeks, uh, so many of our lives have been turned upside down. And so uh, <clears throat> Elijah, which says, by the way, in James, I love that, that he was a man with like passion as our passion. He's the same as you and me, that we can be riding high and then we can be laying very low in just an instant of time. What were some of the things he was facing in his time of crisis? I'd love to stay here, can't do, but first and foremost, he had some physical needs. And if you read through chapter 19, you'll see that God met him and gave him some cake to eat, gave him a jar of water to drink from, provided him with shelter on his journey. And once again, if my, my math is right here, uh, he traveled from Mount Carmel uh, approximately 350 to 400 miles down to this Mount Horeb. And I'll get to that mountain in a minute. But he had very real physical needs. Sometimes our health concerns, that's a primary concern. But our needs go deeper than that. We also have, in a time of crisis, beyond the physical needs, are sometimes intellectual needs. They're, you know, the, the, the mind can play games with us. Uh, why did God allow this tragedy to happen? Why, why were we facing such an impending possible disaster? Uh, we ask the deeper philosophical questions. Is there any meaning in what I'm going through and what I'm experiencing at this hour? Or where, where is God? Actually, where is God when I'm feeling the pain? Where is God when I'm feeling the train? God, are you there? And listen, that's a very honest prayer. That's a very honest state of the soul that we've all experienced. And if your faith today is as bold as a lion, I know because I know you and I know myself that tomorrow it may be as meek as a lamb. So this is the condition of, Eli of Elijah. <clears throat> and it brings to, to mind sometimes a suffering and I, I, I know we like to not see it when it's there. We like to deny it. We, we think if God is so good and so loving, why am I in such a stressful situation that I find myself? And I don't have time to give the long theological answer, but we live in a fallen world. We, we, we live in a world where people hurt people. We live in a world where natural disasters can occur. There are such things as earthquakes and tornadoes and hurricanes. And of course, here in California, fires. And so we're, sometimes we're saying, God, where are you in all of this? And this was the state of Elijah's soul. Uh, he's, he's meditating, thinking, trying to find answers when he had experienced this great presence and victory of God, now struggling with his own life. So there's intellectual needs. 
But this is all intermingled, by the way. I'm just breaking down these needs so that we have a, a points to follow here. But he also had very real emotional needs. If you read through the text, he's kind of lamenting to God, and, and he's kind of crying out, saying, you know, I alone am left. I, I believe part of Elijah's soul, this season of his soul, when he is laying so low, you can read it right there, uh, 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 literally, that he's battling loneliness. And something that I'm hearing more and more, and it may not concern you so much, but people are dealing today in our country with loneliness. And loneliness can happen, by the way, when you're all alone, but it can happen when you're in a crowd. You know, if you read through the Psalms, David, this great king, faced so many times of real loneliness, where, where he struggled to, to really hear God's voice, to really sense God's presence, to really understand fellowship also with other human beings. When he was on the run from King Saul, times of loneliness. Or Jesus himself, Jesus who knows everything and has experienced everything that we feel, says in Hebrews, Jesus felt that. Imagine Jesus in the garden when he was... Uh, left alone, abandoned by his closest friends. When the greatest challenge was coming his way in that night and the next day, he was alone. He would even cry out to God, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So this is Elijah's soul, one of loneliness. I put up here also fear, discouragement, anger, doubt. You know, doubt is also sometimes a reality that we as believers don't like to talk about. It's kind of the, the no word. You don't, you, don't, you don't use that word. But let's be honest, there's times when the soul has its doubts. Where is God in the midst of my mess? Do I really matter anymore? And I can see Elijah losing any sense of significance. After this great victory... And rising to the top and seeing a great revival, he is now bowed down saying, do I really matter anymore? And this is where I want to get to my message that God cares for your soul. Whether you're riding high or laying low, God cares for your soul. Elijah, <clears throat> among his other needs that I've mentioned, had some deep spiritual needs. He needed to connect with his God again. So it says he takes this long journey and keeps going south, 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 and he comes to Mount Horeb. Why this particular mountain? There's other mountains in the nation of Israel, but he leaves Israel proper and travels down to the, what's the peninsula, the Egyptian peninsula, to go to Mount Horeb. And I put the answer up there for you on the screen because Horeb is the same mountain as Sinai. And it was on Sinai that Moses spent 40 days and 40 nights waiting to hear from God who gave him then the Ten Commandments. And so I believe, I believe Elijah took this long journey because he wanted to be at that place where God spoke so clearly to his spiritual father, Moses. To have that time to hear God's voice again and that God could minister to his soul. You know, at one time, I was many, many years ago, I traveled and I went to the traditional site of Mount Sinai. We woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning because the blessing is to beat the daily heat and be up there for the sunrise. And so we left very early, and we, we, I was a lot younger back then, and, and I and my friends who were traveling, we, 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 we went up the switchbacks as fast as we could. We wanted to be the first ones to the top of the mountain. Uh, slight disappointment when we got up there because there's 100 Koreans up there already worshiping God. So that was a, an awesome moment as, as well. But then the singing stopped as the sun was rising, and there was such a quiet, I mean, a, a quiet, quiet, where you could literally hear a pin drop. There's a gentle breeze, and we just 
enjoyed the moment and try to put yourself back into the time of Moses alone on the mountain or the time of Elijah now on the mountain. In fact, some commentators believe that Elijah went to the very cleft in the, in the rock where Moses experienced the glory of God passing by. It's an awesome opportunity just to sense God's presence and to let God minister to the soul. So I believe in our times of vulnerability, and if we're honest, we all have times of vulnerability, God wants to do some soul mending. So here's how this story ends. Elijah's on the mountain. And if you remember back in the time of Moses, there was a great shaking, a great stirring, a lightning bolts and great thunder on the mountain. But here, for Elijah, his experience is somewhat different. It says the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And I just want to end with just sharing a few thoughts about the still, small voice. Because when it comes to soul care, it's about the still, small voice. Sometimes in the loudness of a celebration or of an event, we really can't hear God. We think sometimes if the volume's turned up, God is speaking. But you know, when it comes to soul care, we need to hear the small, still small voice. I love the German word, by the way. We talk about counseling here. It's a, the American word we use when, for counselors. But the German word is Zelsorge, which means soul care. Soul care. And that's what counseling should be all about. It's caring for the soul. So in this situation, Elijah hears the still, small voice. And I'm going to conclude that in a minute, but I just wanted to say this much, that God cares for the soul. I think so often when Jesus met with Peter after the resurrection, and Peter's kind of deflated in his spirit. Uh, and Jesus asked him three times, Peter, do you love me more than these? You know that story. What was Jesus doing? He was ministering to the soul of Peter. He was uplifting, edifying, bringing healing and restoration to Peter. So that Peter uh, writes later in his epistle, Wherefore, let them that suffer... Them that suffer according to the will of God, commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. I was kind of this week meditating on that verse, but I, I like this part, number one, commit the keeping of the soul to him. Isn't that beautiful? When's the last time you've done that? See, sometimes we're trying to fix everything ourselves. And we're going through the, the motions and we're doing our devotionals or we're memorizing a scripture and we're spending time in prayer. But a lot of that even is self-effort. Where How I understand this verse, there's a time we just need to surrender. The keeping of our souls to him. And then it says this. As unto a faithful creator. That kind of gave me pause because why not surrender, commit our souls to a faithful father? Or a faithful friend in Jesus? Or a faithful comforter in the Holy Spirit? But it says here creator. And I'm pondering a guess here, but when I think of creator, it's the one who made you. And it's the one who really knows you. It's the one who really cares. And you have the Trinity, the blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as creator God. And so that brought a lot of edification to me, even as we are all going through different things at this particular season, to commit the keeping of your soul 
to him as to a faithful creator. One of all-time favorites from Jeremiah in the book of Lamentations. Jeremiah, after seeing the devastation and so much suffering that has come to the people of God, he says it's through the Lord's mercies. We are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. He's a faithful creator, a faithful redeemer, a faithful father, friend, and comforter. And then Jeremiah says, the Lord is my portion, says my soul. That's soul care. That's committing your soul to him. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. And then finally, Jesus says, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You see, whether you're riding high in a moment of, of triumph with your faith or laying low because it seems things are unraveling before your eyes and you're battling with discouragement or even despair, here's the invitation from Jesus himself. is to go to him if you're heavy laden and he will give you rest. And then he says this, and you will find rest for your soul. So I just want to encourage in closing that you take a few minutes today to, to get alone. Perhaps when this uh, sermon ends, uh, if you're with family, you know, take a five-minute walk, take a ten-minute walk, go into another room, and spend some time to surrender your soul to him, to invite him into your trouble spots. And whether it be discouragement or self-pity or or anger, whatever may be troubling your soul to allow him in, the creator who's so faithful and who so knows you, who knows your thoughts, the words that you speak, the things that are really weighing you down, and let him minister to you this day. It's a wonderful way, the way the story of Elijah ends. He doesn't end again with some great victory on a mountain. God speaks to him in this voice, and he says, I want you to go just to one person. I want you to go find Elijah, and I want you to minister and call Elijah into the work of the ministry. Most Bible commentators believe that Elijah and Elijah walk together for about 10 years. We don't read of any, any other great exploits by Elijah. But he ministered to this one man. And how do we know that Elijah loved Elijah? You read that when Elijah was taken up into heaven, that Elijah cried out, my father, my father. And I believe as a father ministered to the son, the son was honoring his spiritual father. And you know, it's Elijah in the New Testament that appears on another mountain called the Mount of Transfiguration where he and Moses, the two men who spent so much time on Mount Sinai, on Mount Horeb, were now standing with Jesus. And they had this awesome privilege to be recognized of all the prophets of the Old Testament, of all the great leaders that Israel knew, to be able to stand with Jesus on the mountain. And so Elijah, this man of like passions with like us, who had a moment of triumph and knew the agony of defeat, his creator, his God and friend, ministered to his soul. And I wanted to end with a children's prayer, something we've probably all heard. And I want to use it almost as a benediction. And, and there's something about a childlike prayer. And this may not be a thousand percent theologically correct, but I love the spirit of the prayer because it is a child prayer committing their soul to the care of their creator. If you're at home and you just want to pray this along, you can do it now. Now I lay me 
down to sleep, even though you may be getting up right now. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And should I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Childlike trust in one who cares for your soul. High or low, he cares for you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for this awesome narrative, this story we find in the pages of Scripture. These events in the life of a man who lived to serve you, who went through the highs and the lows of life, and you met him along the way. Whether answering and coming down in fire or speaking to him in the still small voice, you met with Elijah. So I just want to pray as I spoke about that we would surrender our souls to you this day. That we'd commit our souls to your care. Even as Romans says that when we worship that we present our bodies as a living sacrifice. I believe we need to present our souls as well. That the command to love God with all of our heart and with all of our soul with all of our mind and with all of our strength, applies. So, Lord, take this soul. I pray for healing virtue to be released where there's a hurt and the pains and the not understanding, and that you would give to each and every one of us that perfect peace that passes all understanding. And we will give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May God bless your day, whether you're with family or with friends. Let's lift our countenances up because we can say, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. God bless you, love you, looking so forward to the day when we sit together here as a family and stand together to praise and to worship. It's not too far off. And in the meantime, let's keep one another in prayer. Send out a text, write an email. Let's be an encouragement to one another as we're navigating this time on planet Earth. God is still working in the mix. He's in the mix, and he's going to bring good things because uh, all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. May God bless you. Amen.